Hey everybody, welcome to Delta Flodge Outdoors, Julius Craig here today. We have a great episode I film, uh, recorded with Jeremy and Daniel with Do It Yourself Outdoors. I'm going to go and just dive into that podcast. We recorded it. it, may have a little background noise. I was uh, at the hotel while we were doing it, so hold on, we'll get into this one in just a second. Everybody, Julius Craig with Delta Flodge Outdoors. Here today, I have Jeremy and Daniel with me with uh, Do It Yourself Honor. Um, hey guys, how are y'all? Pretty good. How about you? I'm good. I'm, uh, can't complain. Um, you know, I'm, I'm over here actually in the Panhandle of East Oklahoma, and they're, it's actually raining and hailing right now, which is you know kind of a surprise because it, it doesn't rain out here very often. But um, we'll. Uh, Go ahead. We in Mississippi are just hot as heck. Oh, yeah. It was around that high humidity and about 99. Well, luckily, the humidity out here is not crazy, but the high temp today was 109. Okay. That, was, that, was the, that, was the, that was the temperature, not the heat index. Yeah. Uh, so we got some rain popping up, but we'll go on and dive into this and uh, get y'all to introduce yourselves here and tell the listeners who y'all are and tell us about Do It Yourself Hunter and the background behind it and everything. I'm, I'm Jeremy Avery. I'm, I'm 57. We from Bruce, Mississippi here. Uh, like I said, started two seven hundred years ago back in early 2000s. Uh, but we really just got it going again uh, in 2020. We're going to YouTube. I got Daniel involved in it here. I'll let you tell this side here. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Daniel Lemon. He got me filming. Uh, I guess it's 2019 we started filming, and then we started in 2020. So I've uh, I've experienced a lot of stuff in the past four or five years. That's for sure. Okay. Um, what? So, um, Jeremy, you originally started it from what I saw. Kind of, it dates back many years, about 20 years ago now, huh? Yeah, cause like I said, I had a goal when I was in my early 20s. I wanted to make a living. And I, I did make it to the Outdoor Channel in 2003. We was on two quarters. So, like I said, things just didn't work out. And, uh, like I said, I, I, I filmed a lot since then, just for my own. But like I said, when Daniel was sort of on, he was interested in it. We, we sort of started back. And like I said, we just hit the ground running. Okay. Yo, and, uh, from, you know, y'all do a lot of public land hunting, and uh, have a, y'all have a set of skills I guess y'all put forward to that uh, if y'all want to give us a little idea of how that works for y'all and I think you hunt out of Mississippi also like y'all hunt pretty much all over huh yeah we got a, what we call is chasing the rut you know we'd like to you know you can the last week of October to pretty much the first week of February you can find the folks rutting somewhere in this country mm-hmm. uh, and like I said we just jump around it really that, that's our style Style of hunting. Uh, you know, we like to go into a place and really go to travel corridor. Uh, you know, because basically that time you get on their rut, and they, you, you got them wrong. And we've had you know good success at that, and we've really encouraged people get out of their comfort zone and and and, and, and try public land hunting, try traveling. See, that, that's what I grew up doing, and um, even like I actually, oddly enough, um, I grew up. South Louisiana, we hunted a lot of public land. We and uh, the hunting club we actually were in was in a little town called Suntag, Mississippi, mm-hmm. and um, which is just out of Brookhaven. And, I, and we would still we would hunt there, but we would still make we had a once a year, you know, last of October in Southwest Louisiana, public lands open for rifle. So the last weekend we would always make that hunt because we could pretty much rifle hunt two weeks ahead of anywhere else, you know. So we would, and I grew up doing that like my whole life and it's like um we were we were talking before we started uh, the podcast here i moved to oklahoma a couple years ago and um i hunted a little bit of public land my first year here and then i hunted uh last year i made like three hunts the entire year and they were actually i, b- I bought a place over in east oklahoma and they were on it and um one of the reasons i bought the place it's next door to an old uh 400 and like 60 acre high fence game for them and uh uh-huh. the back fence got tore down in 2012 and they never fixed the fence the deer got out and everything so the owner was just like screw it and uh it's changed hands a few times since then but we have some really good genetics in the area now 
And um, so uh, the the county I live in, the the uh, like 181 inch non typical is the county record. It was killed a few years ago, and um, oddly enough, it was killed by my little boy's best friend's grandpa. And if you go through the woods, it was killed about a mile and a half from my house. Okay. So we, that was when I was looking to buy, I found, a, I found a place I wanted. I liked it. It was, you know, something, it was 80 acres. I could have my horses, had a nice house on it, not a shop. And then what it was next door to just made it, you know, Hey, I, I'm going to do this, but I still hunt a lot of public land and, you know, I'm getting back into it. And like my, my nine year old son, he, he'll be 10 in September. And like, he's been on public land with me. You know, he's grew up scouting and stuff. And he's like, he was asking me the other day, he's like, Dad, when are we going to hunt public land this year or whatever? I was like, I probably will this year, but you, you won't until next year because I was like, I'll take, I'll start putting you more on it when you're 11 or 12 when I know you can, you know, so i just not ready to start taking him yet to, to it. And um, oddly enough, today at the job, I'm out in the panhandle. They have a wildlife management about 20 minutes from my job site, and I scouted it last year. Had some good deer sign on it. They have another one that I scouted two years ago and had some cameras on. And if I can uh, find some of the pictures, I'll send them to y'all later. Uh, I sent one to uh, Eberhart one night when we were talking, John Eberhart. And he's like, dude, that's like a 160 inch public land deer. I was like, yeah. And um, on a place out here in Oklahoma. And uh, today I had to go to lunch with my boss and everything. And he's like, hey, by the way, two weeks from now, we're gonna move you to this other job. And it is literally 15 minutes from the WMA that I scouted two years ago that I was like trying to figure out how I was going to go hunt some this year because it's three hours from the house and they're literally yeah. putting me on a job 15 minutes from it. <laughs> right, you know, in the next couple weeks and I'll be out there for like the next four months so I'm like, heck yeah, I'm going to make deer season on the public land I wanted to, you know, so I get to hunt every, I was like, I'll hunt a few, a few days after work every evening, you know, like I can hunt after work. So it works out great. So, you know, take, take the small wins when you get them. <laughs> you know? yeah. But um, growing up hunting, like, and like you just said, chasing a rut and finding corridors and hunting all over, do y'all kind of, like you said, hunting Mississippi, y'all, y'all, it's probably big woods and maybe a little hilly where you hunt, or how? Well, I think, uh, I think here, we got a, we got a big diversity from, from one side of the state to the other. And we got the case that we're hunting for Delta, which is more bottom land, river mm-hmm. bottom, flat terrain, um, it can be it can be thick, you know, bigger woods or it can be it can be open stuff depending on where you hunt. Um, but then over here around where we live it's pretty much hilly and uh, thick, super thick cover. But it does get a lot of dog hunt right here where we live, so mm-hmm. rut's kinda of funny and, and the deer they travel funny and, but it's still it's still good hunting. I was gonna say I grew up hog hunting and you got people that like it's one of those people love it or they hate it there's no in between and um, oh, yeah. i grew up doing it and uh, it's like i was talking to some guys the other day about it i'm like it's it's as normal down there in louisiana mississippi arkansas like it's as normal there as drives are in wisconsin and pennsylvania and places like that like it's just normal and yeah. it's like oh, you yeah. know and like but you get people that are like ah but it hurts the deer herd it hurts this it, it, it doesn't i like you can probably uh seen this you watch a deer cross out one morning on a pipeline with five dogs behind them and watch them come back in that evening <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. It, it, the main thing when it messes them up you try to still hunt pattern them mm-hmm. they don't pattern yeah you know, they don't they don't they seem like they move more the evening than it that's what i was gonna say growing up hunting in that, where i did in mississippi it was more of a if you wasn't running dogs like you hunted in the evenings there was no reason to get up and hunt early because the deer didn't move early yeah. and it was like and um you know growing up with that but back to what i think i was what i was asking ago, like when y'all when y'all travel do y'all try to kind of duplicate and copy what you're used to hunting or if you get or you're you're confident enough in what you do to go there and find a corridor and no matter what it is it's you know do you copy rants repeat or do you look or are you okay you know, I'm well, like, if, if I said, I got this stuff on, uh, you watch it, you can see my style of hunt. I like my river bottom, I like my water. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I look for that when I go to another state. Uh, I look for water access, I'm just navigable. Uh, but I do like challenge myself. And, you know, I'm a flatland. I, I still, I don't like these mountains and stuff like that. 
or Daniel Wright said he was kind of the best guy. Yeah, we, I do try to look at what I'm, I, I think I'm pretty good in it. But I will step out of comfort zone too just to jump into a step. That's seeing like you talk about diversity of the land, like when I moved to Oklahoma. They have way more deer here than they have in Louisiana, Mississippi. The deer herds, like, it's more numbers. But it's like the area I live in, in East Oklahoma, is uh, it's hilly. It's I have a bunch of oaks and everything, like post oaks and everything. Like it's hilly and trees. I don't, and I have oaks and cedars. The area I live in is mainly like that. But you get like the wildlife management. I was telling you about that. I'll be the one out here by me now and the one I'm going to in a few weeks, it is flat and open with a sparse tree here or there. But once you figure out the deer, they're really kind of easy to hunt on that open land like that once you figure them out. And um, that was a total game changer for me because, like, I'm used to hunting pine plantations and everything. I get up here, and the first time I go to a WMA, I can see 20 miles. I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? And... <laughs> Myself and my little boys were scouting, and we ended up seeing 22 head of deer that day. And I'm like, oh, yeah. that's what we do with this. But, um, you know, so you said Daniel hunts more of uh, the hills and everything? Yeah. Like I said, Daniel's 23 years old. Oh, okay. He's still a young one. Yeah. So, okay. so, he ain't got to Do what, buddy? It cut out. I, I said, Daniel, I said, he's built for the problems. I said, he's a young, younger, slender guy, 23 years old. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm 57. I'm in Paris, I think we're 57, but I, I'm a flint I, I don't want to be my age. Everybody's in shape until they go to dragging a deer out. Like, like I said, we don't do much dragging a deer out. We bone them suckers out where we at to get them out. Oh, okay. That's... Hunting by myself, I've gotten more into that because, like, trying to cart it out or drag it out, it, it's a pain by yourself. Um, so, like I said, y'all spend a lot of time, y'all bounce around uh, and chase the rut. Um, you you look for the corridors and everything, what they're moving in. When Do you do it, like, and I'm asking because I've, I've looked at some of y'all stuff, but I'm trying to, you know, that way people that have it can kind of understand what y'all do, you know, beforehand, like, you gonna pull it out and you're gonna e-scout or are you just gonna you do you go to different areas regular or is it or you been to this area so you're gonna go back there that's where you know no it's course. if i kill a big deer in the area yeah i'll probably be back here but i like challenging myself and go to new places i think i've done it 23 different states so i don't like hunting tiny places often very much because i look at i think you're missing something out something at a different area oh yeah you definitely and that's you know that that's me like i i'll hunt this year i'm hunting um i'm gonna make a hunt in north louisiana to a bow hunt only wildlife management that i've got some experience with and then i'll hunt a couple of, here in oklahoma next year uh 2025 season i'm probably gonna hunt missouri because and, uh, cause we're still doing po- doing our points for kansas then nebraska went to a point state so withdrawal so I'm just going to collect points for a year or two before I go there. But I plan on going to Nebraska or Missouri this year, and I just don't think the plans are going to work out. Because uh, I like that. I like the challenge. I like the challenge of going somewhere else and seeing if I can duplicate and, you know, like, and see if I'm actually learning anything or if I'm just getting lucky. And, uh, you know, so that's that's the main thing there. Um, diving back in the... Go ahead. be lucky today. Right. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Um, yeah. Diving back into, uh, um, you, 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 like I said, you did 0203, then you was on the sports uh, outdoor channel, then you stopped for a while. You brought Daniel in, and you know, at 19 to the uh, 1920, and y'all started filming on YouTube and everything. So basically, you fired back up right as COVID hit, and uh, started going that route. Um, give us a so. Give us a little bit of, you know, how much do you see in changes of what you were doing back then to what you're doing now? Like, what is the, and it can be just the, you know, like, 
how, how much have you changed? Not just the 20 years of age, just the... Well, well, okay. But, you know, I, I basically had a goal to make a living hunting. After I got close to the age I am now, I basically, when, when, I did, when it did work, 2003, I started back and I invested in different. I'm pretty much retired now. I've been retired four years. But I can hunt all the time. I want to now. Uh, so I, I, I started it back. You know, when I was trying to do it in 2003, you had a family, so you're trying to do it and make a living too. Mm-hmm. And it didn't work. No. But now I started back. It's not the priority. You know, I didn't have to make a living in it. I had income from somewhere else to pay all the bills. And, and it's like I said, and when we've got it, it's, it's really growing. It's growing a lot in the last two years. Yes, sir. And um, so, like, Brian Daniel in, uh, is he more, he said he does the filming. And he, is he kind of the guy that does your edit? Like, he's the, being the younger guy, yeah, he's I, got a little more, uh, he's a little more well, update I, on the. Well, yeah, he's more <laughs> tech savvy than I am, but like I said, we both, we both better grow stuff. Okay. So, yeah, that's why. Like and like I said, we sell them. So we, we, do, we both sell them. Uh, we basically split up when we go places, and you know, it goes one way and I go the other. And self filming is a whole nother booger in itself. <laughs> it can it can make or break a hunt real quick. Because uh, I, I last year I uh, I didn't have my camera with me. I had my phone, and uh, I had an eleven point at twenty five yards, and got and was fumbling around just filming with my phone. Then managed to drop the phone. So he, he ran out and stopped at about 125 yards, and I shot him. I had his rifle season. I shot him and killed him. But I was like, you know, here I am at 25 yards just playing around with him, and dang near it cost myself. So then I didn't get it, I didn't get any of it on cam film because it fell, and I think the video is like facing back up, looking at me hanging out of a tree in a saddle <laughs> from the ground up. And me and probably and I think I'm mumbling and cussing because I'm like you know I just screwed this one up. And uh, he ran out there about 125 yards stop and kind of quartered to me a little bit and looked back towards me and I shot him. But if it would have been bow season, I would have completely blew it. Where I got lucky, I was in rifle season. But, well, the main thing is the family. It's come a long way. Three the cameras, cameras and the gear, the camera arms. Mm-hmm. Yes. The main thing on the self image is to punish and kill him, not just kill him. Yeah. And as the every everything has came so far and the, like there was just like I guess probably the last fifteen well, I, everything since it went digital everything went digital everything got smaller. Right. You know, well, we used to put a mini you know, mini DVs. Yeah, and that was a, that was recorded like an old, you know, well, eight yeah. by eight, what they call them. You know, it, it, was, it was recorded on a t- thing, and, he, and you could actually only erase it very easy. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, I remember, like, I'm 39, I'll be 40 in February. Like, I remember when we'd go camping when I was little, my aunt had a camera that took, like, VHS tapes. Like, not the little mini tape. It took, like, almost a whole, like, VHS tape. <laughs> yeah, VHS, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we, yeah. When we started, that was what everybody was filming on. Then it went to the, unless you use high tech stuff, that really tried all the cameras, but man, they weighed 30 pounds. It was big old ones. Oh, yeah. You could throw it and kill the deer. <laughs> it was, yeah. it was, yeah. And um, so that's, that's, you know, everything's changed so much. And then, like you said, it's, you know, trying to make a living out of it is tough because, like, I've got my stuff I do with uh, my deer feed and everything. And, like, trying to I when I first started that it was going pretty good then I went through a divorce and up and down and the world went around you know and then just trying to get started back on that and then move then I moved and everything but it's like if you're if you're working a full-time job to make sure your family's supported it's hard to build something else and you know start and stop and you're something else will eventually mess it up completely and uh so like diving back into it well, yeah, you know, that's why I, I really waited to where I, when I basically retired, where I started back. Because, like, to lead your way through the crowd, you got to be different. Like I said, most folks can not film a hunter too because they got to work. But, mm-hmm. you know, how we sort of rigged up now, we, we can get a lot more appreciation most of the average person. Oh, yeah. And, uh, 
that that's what makes it you know that'll make or break you um so let's see th this year what y'all season mississippi you're going to be october 1st do you hunt, start hunting earlier or, or early season or do you wait for a run what do you prefer i don't know no we we start i draw the line and we go to your tag i'll be out there in september nice. and, i mean kentucky owns the seventh i think mm -hmm. you know, I said, Daniel, he's still works, but he, he's got a pretty flexible schedule. <laughs> he'll hunt a, a, a little bit. Let you tell him, let him tell you his Yeah, that's, sounds good. Uh, well, used to, I was always an October guy here in Mississippi. I always thought I had to hunt October. And uh, I think I think Jeremy, he definitely got me out of that, especially when I started traveling. Because it just ain't near as fun hunting Mississippi in October. So I don't, I really focus on Mississippi uh, when the rut hits, like Christmas, mm -hmm. first of January, something like that. I really don't try to spend much time, at least right here around the house. But now I'll go hit the Delta earlier um, because it's usually first, second week of December is when, when the rut hits there. But uh, I really focus right here close to home in the end of December to first, mid January, you know, all the way pretty much the end of the season. But starting off this year, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to go to Kentucky. Uh, in September and hunt that and then I'll come home and I, I really don't plan on going nowhere else till in October and when I leave on, on that trip I got several states planned on that uh, hopefully I, I can make them all but uh, when I leave on that trip I'll be gone probably three to four weeks and don't plan on coming back that's awesome uh, if you don't mind me asking you can answer or not what states are you hitting well, I, like I said, I'm going to Kentucky, and I got Minnesota, Kansas, uh, and the other, other one, I'm going to leave it for a surprise for everybody. So okay. We'll, uh, we'll just have to, you have to see that in the video. All right, sounds good. Uh, yeah, we, uh, you doing, uh, we're doing, we're putting in for Kansas points. My bu I got a buddy that, uh, he, uh, one of my good friends, Brant, his, his best friend is, one of his good friends is Matt. I know Matt through Brand. Matt grew up in Kansas, and uh, Matt and Brant went a couple years ago to Kansas in and, um, and bow season, and uh, they're wanting to go back, so we've been putting points in. They're wanting to go to 2026 season. They're wanting to do rifle, and I'm like, man, that's going to be cold. December 2nd through the 11th, I think it's going to be cold, but you going for you going in bow or rifle? Oh, bow. That's what I... I'm not really a gun hunter. I, I mean, I gun hunt. Don't get me wrong, but if I had the choice, I'd rather the bow hunt. That's uh, me. I, I, all my out of state trips are all archery. See, that's how like I'm. A, I got into bow hunting and I really enjoy it. And it's like I, that's what I was like, man. I'd rather go bow hunt it, but it's it's y'all's trip, y'all planning. I'm just going with y'all. What gun? What gun can I bring? <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it's like if I was planning a trip, it'd be a bow trip, but. When um, we actually were planning on um, uh, Kentucky, he's same boy Brent. He's got a lady that he worked with. He's a nurse, and he's got a lady he worked with who just retired. That was her and her husband retired she was a nurse, and he was a doctor or whatever. And they bought a place in Kentucky that's like next door to like literally it butts up to like Daniel Boone uh, or publicly you know Daniel Boone National Forest there. You know, and they eastern part of the state. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a big old Yeah, they were like, oh, y'all can come stay here and hunt, you know, and uh, hunt all you want. Da -da. So he's like, look, we got to find a place to stay and we go hunt. That'd be a good hunt to go. I'm like, whatever you want to do, buddy. Like, you know me, I'll just bring a tent. Like, I, like if we going, we going. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, the, that's another thing is how we travel. We got our vehicles fixed up. We stay in our vehicle. It's pretty much like a car camper. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what, um, if I'm by myself, I have mine where I'll do that, but, like, if it's two or three of us, I usually, like, we. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's one reason why we go by our a lot more fish. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we, uh, I'll take this year and hunt, like I said, uh, I was planning on Nebraska this year until they switched it to a draw instead of over-the-counter, and I probably still could have got my over-the-counter ticket, you know, uh, t tag basically with one point but i was like i'm not even gonna deal with it and so um but i've also or uh 
wherever my house is at is like an hour and a half out of a uh, excuse me, uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. So I'm literally right there in Ar- at Arkansas to make some hunts too. And their, their season runs like February 28th. So I may end up hunting Arkansas this year just because it's right there. And their season runs from mid, like third week of September to February 28th. So basically my season ends June the 15th here in Oklahoma. So, I mean, January 15th here in Oklahoma. So it'd give me like another month and a half. So I'm like, it's kind of worth it. But um, y'all, so... Something I like to ask everybody: You grew up hunting, Jeremy, or like, is it like a dad or grandpa, or you self-taught? How did you? Yeah, hey, I, I grew up hunting. I shot my first deer when I was eight years old. Um, I said, but they weren't many deer around here back in the seventies. Uh, they, you know, it just wasn't. You know, when I was a kid, running around in Bruce, but that was them. We hardly ever seen a deer. It was up west of town, but it we had a big warehouse and they'll come. 73 or 74, started clear cut all this hard work and the pine trees back. Oh, man, a deer population has exploded in the 80s and 90s. That's the going back to what I said earlier about hunting in Suntag, Mississippi. The older men I used to hunt with that's what they used to talk about. They said they used to, you know, because they had the club that I was in when I was a kid was like between private land and leased land, and all that was like 20,000 acres. It was big. Now it's two, it's probably like 3,000 acres now. And uh, last I talked to him, but it was back in the 70s. That club, that club was started. I hunted it from like 95 to 2003 or 4. And that club had been started back in the 70s with the original members and everything. And they literally talk about riding around all day looking for a deer track crossing the road so they could call each other on the CB and bring a dog there to see if it was fresh enough for the dogs to run it. Because they say there were no deer. And, yeah, uh, that was good. Very so yeah, that you, you're not the only person I've heard that from, and a lot of people don't know that you know, like they know Louisiana is the population dwindled way down, but they a lot of people don't realize how bad Mississippi's was, and then it rebounded. So well, and that's what in the fifties and early sixties that's planted a lot in Mississippi. That's why I feel like our butts carry so. They finally got a lot of them from some of them from Wisconsin up north. You can tell where them come from. Wisconsin stuff, that Delta strand. Mm-hmm. The rush, the rush a lot different. Yeah. Yep. Deer, the, the, the deer size is a lot different too, body wise. Yep. And and antlers, you know. Yep. Same same thing. Growing up in Louisiana, like hunting them, and I hunted like I said, South Mississippi. There, you could you could tell the difference in different areas of the of each state. But uh, you said you grew up hunting, killed your first deer when you were eight, and yeah, you were kind of hooked after that, or what? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love dog. Uh, like I said, we got a lot of small game running right, stuff, too, squirrel hunting. Like I said, most old guys I met, they quail hunt it or they squirrel hunt it. Mm-hmm. They, they, they wasn't no deer when they was a girl. But that's, and now we don't have any quail. Very, very few. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Daniel? Was it, where, what's your background what, in it? Well, pretty, pretty much the same. Uh, I started off hunting. Uh, when I was real young, my dad took me when I was about three years old, turkey hunting with him. But actually, it started before that. It took me when I was seven months old, uh, behind the house. It was a shooting house and everything. Took me up there and uh, put me in the shooting house, got me to sleep. He was sitting there and a deer come out and killed it. So, I mean, you could say I've been pretty much deer hunting my whole life, or hunting in general. <laughs> but uh, I started hunting, uh, actually carrying a gun when I was about six. Killed a turkey when I was six. Uh, killed a deer first deer when I was seven. Killed my first buck when I was eight. And then started bow hunting when I was about 12. First year I didn't, didn't have any luck. Um, I was actually hunting with an old game point uh, bow. About 44 pounds, hard as you could draw. Uh, it, it, it was it was pretty, pretty antique. But uh, ended up, uh, when I was 13, killed my first doe. Took four shit. Uh, took three shots to kill it because I kept missing it. But uh, that, that's really where my, my bow hunt got kicked off. And then uh, after that, upgraded, got a new bow, and uh, started hunting and hunting even more and more. And that, that's about all I think about, bow hunting, shoot my bow all the time, and uh, really just try to be the best I can. I've been I've been bow hunting, I guess you could say, for 11 years now. What what kind of bow you shoot now? Uh, right now I got a PSE. Okay. Um, I, actually, I actually got two of them. I, I, 
really like the PSE. Just, I think more more of my style, my fit, and, and I got a 30 inch draw too. So, yeah, uh, that's a long draw. Yeah. So and that PSE with the, with the longer axle axle really feels better to me, and it's not near as aggressive as some of these other boats. And it it out of all the ones, and I shoot just about every one of them when I go to get a new boat just to see which one feels. And, and the PSE just about every time has been the best. Yeah, that's what I just switched to uh, a gearhead this year. Okay. Um, the I got the I switched to the twenty four inch pro. Yeah. It's axle to axle twenty four inches. Uh, because I don't have it like a twenty six and a quarter inch draw. I'm you know, so, and I saddle hunt. So it's like out of the saddle with that thing. Mm-hmm. It's it's crazy the movement you have, like how small it is. Like when I got when I got it and was like. You know, I, I shot one and was looking at it and everything. I'm like, I don't know about this. Like, it's it's small. And they make a 20 inch, and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going that small. You can get the 20, the 24, or the 30, and I went with the 24. But like, it's axle to axle is 24. I have a 26 inch straw, and it shoots like it's adjustable 65 to 75 pounds, and it's let off adjustable like 70 to 80 percent. So you can you got a lot of adjustment in it, but it's like I've I've shot all of them like you do, and it's like I was gonna go with a. Uh, Botech because I, I liked it. Then I had the opportunity with this bow, and I was like, it was just, it felt, you know, like you said, when you felt it, it felt right. Um, so, but uh, y'all, um, so that that got you into yours and everything. So then my next thing is what I like I like to ask uh, y'all, uh, next generation, like y'all, y'all are how introducing the next generation to the outdoors. I would assume, uh, you know, you, you've probably done it more, Jeremy, than Daniel has. Uh, uh, no, that's sir. You know, when I got doing this in 2003, I had a guy here in my show, and he was a pretty good mark guy. Mm-hmm. He always said, let's go together. What's in it for the viewers? Mm-hmm. You know, instead of just going hunting, what, what is the viewer got? So when we started this back in 2020, that's when I told Daniel, what, what, Let's, let's be more educational, encouraging. Like I said, I got a grandpa. Mm-hmm. I, I, look, I look at it like, I want him to have the same opportunity. I want his kids to have the same opportunity I've had in high. Like I said, I've hunted out west a lot, the mountain states, when I was in my 20s. Uh, I've hunted pretty much all the black and white western states. And killed elk in several. I, I want our grandkids, great grandkids have the same opportunity. The best way I, I, I feel like to do that is get more people involved in hunting on public land. Uh, more people, more people I think, hunting and be more there to protect you down the road. I, I actually agree with that because if, like, if you've got more people doing it, they're seeing it and they're realizing what they're losing if it goes away. And a lot of people don't realize, you know. and stuff because that's considered a trophy yeah. but when you look at the bigger picture of it if they can get it banned like that it's easy to write in where they ban mule deer, mule deer white tail or elk hunting because you're trophy hunting certain animals of it so yeah. technically they can fix if they can get it passed they're going to fix Colorado Color, if that passes and I, I I could be way off but if it passes I see Colorado being a non non hunting state in 10 years like I said, that, that's why I'm, I'm here fighting, trying to get everybody I can to, 
you know, get out here and help protect it uh, and, and enjoy it. It's, it's all ours. It, we all got the same rights. If you're American citizen, you got the same rights to hunt in this public land. Uh, exactly, and that's what, you know, it's like, like I said, I grew up, we hunted that club at some, so I was fortunate, and it's like, I've got a buddy of mine that, uh, he's, he's, I'm 39, he's 40 already. He's never hunted public land in his life. You know, he's got kids now that are, his son's about 14, his daughter's like 16, they hunt with him. He called me a few weeks back and he's like, hey, you know, I think I'm gonna hunt some public land this year. Cause he's, and I was like, why? He's like, well, my son's wanting to do it and I've never done it. Like, I'm like, you know, his, if it wasn't for his 14 year old son, hey dad, I've been watching these videos and I've been doing this and that, I wanna go hunt public land. And he's like, well, you know, it's not as easy as they portray it. And he's like, I just want to go. He's like, I've never done it. And Brandon's like, well, I hadn't either. So then he's calling me. He's like, hey, you know, in October when you make that hunt, can we come? I'm like, shoot, I don't care. Like, you know, it's like, but 40 years old, he's never been on it. He's he's never set foot on public land for any rec- recreational activities. And it's like, he would spend the rest of his life never doing it if his son, you know, with the way social media is and everything, hadn't seen stuff and people doing it and like, hey, I want to try this. And it's like, he's an outdoorsman. He's going to vote for outdoorsman. But when it comes down to considering public land or this or that, he's never sat down and looked at it because it's never been important to him. Yeah. And well, like I said, it's a challenge. But, but another factor of that, you come about years ago, you said a hunt club. A lot of people have lost their plate to hunt. Yeah. Say that maybe not only grandparents like grandpa dies, uh, state sells it. They they lose their plate, so that real well, they got is on public land. Yep. But so it, it's it, it's getting popular. But another thing, I I think the more we can get up in it, we'll get into the legislature and stuff. There's federal money. Anytime you buy guns, anytime you buy ammunition, there's a tax that that they collect off of that. But that that's what that's for. I don't know the exact name of that tax, but. It, it, yeah, I've hunted a lot of public areas there, and they basically say this is all in part with federal funds, with matching federal funds. Yep. See, it's like here in Oklahoma, they have, um, and same thing they have in Kansas, like your, they call it OLAP here, but it's like your walk in areas. Uh huh. Well, that was just your regular, like, your walk in area when you bought your regular license, it was like hunting a WMA. You could just go hunt it, right? Now, yeah. you have to buy a $100 permit to be able to go on my walk in lands. And it's like, here well, no. It's like this year. Have you looked at what an unrest device it is for Illinois? I mean, for Oklahoma? Yeah, it does. $708. It went from 300 to 708 That's right. So they won't be doing many unrestes out there this year. No, and that's why what they did, you know, <laughs> the locals, because I'm on a lot of the hunting groups and I read stuff and I'm laughing because it's like the, the residents, Oh, that's going to cut down on the on that, you know, like the that. So that's going to make the prices of the land go back down, so we can lease it. I don't think that's going to work that way. No, that's what. Yeah, I know. I've heard they claim that a lot of Texas folks is coming up there to lease it. I, I got a buddy that's here that works for a They lease some land out in Oklahoma to bring their clients on. I, I got but, a cousin that lives in South Louisiana, and he's an outfitter up here. With he owns an outfitter service up here with like ten thousand acres. You know? but, but, but here's a negative I can see on the raise of price like yet is just like I was talking about some of them might lost their place to go hunt uh, and they and they make rewarded win a, in a hunt like that if they could afford it a bottle of ice. if that guy quits hunting you stop that that, that tree of hunting mm-hmm. he won't take his kids he won't take the grandkids mm-hmm. that's, that's so I want to try keeping it affordable for everybody so if you know if we then keep hunting I agree, 100%. And that's, you know, uh, we're, we're, I don't want to get too political. We're entering a dark time and all kinds of things, you know, and it's like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to go that far down the rabbit hole, but it's, it's a lot of stuff. I, 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 I definitely, like, like I, I can tell the difference in hunting out west. And first time I got to go was in 83. Colorado, and I got to go in '87 to Montana. Man, things have changed a lot. But come on, all that crap federal out there. It's that's federal land. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, it's I've been out to Colorado a few times because my wife's family has a, pl- has a place out there and we'll go spend a week or so at a time. And um, I've never got to hunt it. I've wanted to go hunt it. And it's like, you know, they've completely changed their system this year. Like we said, once they put the wolves out, that's a, I think that's going to cause issues. Um, but they've also made, oh, there's no over-the-counter archery tags anymore for elk. It's a draw system now. Yeah, this, this year's an issue. But they claim, you know, a lot of folks are hollering that. What that's going to stop is somebody saying, hey, yeah, let's go elk hunting this year. That's not the only place you can go to. No, you're going to overload the others now. Well, you're going to put in by April 1st. you got to put in by April 1st. But they claim they're going to have the number of tags that they issued in 2023. It's not going to be that hard to get a tag. You just got to apply by April 1st. Okay. See, in like yeah, Oklahoma does a point system for like antelope and some deer hunts and like your elk, but their system is a lottery. It's not a point system. The more points you have, the more times your name's entered in the lottery. Not and not a higher. So it's mathematical, not. You know, I got you. So I do like. So like if like with elk, you can get a ta- You can get one point a year, and you can buy an extra point. So you could accumulate two points a year. So if you got two points this year, next year you you'd have two chances to draw. Okay. But you got guys that have been trying to draw for twenty years that don't get it, and you got guys that get drawn on their first try because it's a it's a lottery. Okay. And um, so it's a little different with their draw hunts, and um, then it's like, you know, uh, Kansas. Uh, I think you're gonna end up with point creep there, where you used to could go with one point, like pretty much go every year. You could draw in certain units. Now you have to have one to two points in those. Then Iowa has gotten insane on a lot of their point systems, like what guys are having to take to draw up there. It's five to seven points right now on a lot of those places. Oh, yeah, I've had Iowa bunch. It's, it's definitely, I, I, I'm afraid a lot of other states in the next 10, 15 years are going to do the same thing, go to that, that draw. And any time you can buy a point, you're going to start getting point creep for a few years. Yep. Because like, I, I bought a point in Iowa this year. I know I'm five years, even if even if I can draw tomorrow, I know where I'm at. I'm three to five years before I'm ready to go to Iowa. But yeah, I, well, because a lot of people do that. Yeah. So that's what's going to, in five years, that's why they can get a lot of points. But that, that big old deer tag I got in Wyoming, I had nine points on it when I drove it. Uh, it's, they claim Wyoming makes more off of preference points than they do selling non red selling all their license in a year's time. They figured out how to make money with that. Well, as you can say, it wouldn't surprise me because you take, like, Iowa probably makes a killing on preference points too because it's $61 for a preference point. Uh, yeah. Nebraska is uh, is fifty one or fifty two dollars for a preference point. Yeah, well, yeah. like Wyoming, I, I, the last ten years I bought an elk, a mule deer, and an antelope. I sent them about one hundred fifty dollars every year yeah. for the last ten years. Yeah, and, and I ain't drunk preference points. Yep, and it's it's insane, and I think they're going to keep creeping up. And you know, like I said, like going back to the states. You know, California has banned cat hunting. Um, Colorado's working on banning um, trophy hunts, which would eliminate cats and and eventually turn into hunting, period, because every animal is a trophy hunt, basically. You know? and uh, But I feel like, you know, and I, I'm going to get way out there on this one. I feel like when you start protecting, like, take the wolves, uh, the wolves they turn in there. They're protected. They're going to repopulate. Then... That, that that group kicks the males out and everything else, and it it moves around, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just so, like them, but they, they, they turn loose in yellow stuff. Yeah, yeah. They, they have three states there, pretty. But most of their states have open season up on. Yeah. Well, it's I, don't like, have no, I don't have no problem on Yellowstone, but when they get off Yellowstone, they'll be fair game. Well, you, I agree. Well, you heard, um, and if you hadn't, I'll see if I can find the article again. It was several months back. They had a coyote, uh, a guy, a guy uh, him and his guide were coyote hunting, and they were in um, Michigan, and they shot a really large coyote, right? Yeah. Couldn't find out it was a wolf. That wolf was like 200 miles from any other groups of wolves. Yeah. Well, yeah, they got them. They, they got them in northern Wisconsin, a bunch of them. Folks there in Minnesota, they throw a fit about it. Yeah. They put in a pretty good dent. 
population. Well, it's like, then they wanted to, like, they wanted to, like, it was all over that guy and that hunter, and it's like, you know what, the, it wasn't supposed to be there. It's like a few years back, if you recall, yeah. a few years back, they had a little girl in uh, Missouri shoot an elk, right? Uh-huh. It's a... Oddly enough, it's actually the little girl's one of my cousins, and uh, she was like 11, 12 years old at the time. No, she was 14. She was 14 at the time, so she's probably like 18 to 20 now. And um, she was hunting 12. She was 12 to 14. She was hunting with her dad. He was, you know, away from her, but still in the area. She's shooting a 243. She shoots an elk with it at like 100 yards, drops it, and that's what she's in. T- he calls her daddy and was like, "Daddy, I just killed the biggest deer I've ever seen." Well, he he gets there as a big spike elk. <laughs> There's no elk around there where they're at. So he yeah. calls the game warden. They confiscate it and it's a bunch of stuff with it and everything and like it got, and it went you know worldwide basically and uh people are like oh well she wasn't sure of her shot to have done that da, da. well she shot an elk with a 243 and dropped it in his tracks. She knew what she was she was good with her aim. She knew it was a a deer to her <laughs> but, you know but it became a big stink and everything but guess what now you, now they're getting ready to if they have it they're actually getting ready to open an elk season in Missouri and oh yeah they can they track that elk all back in the east there's a lot of states that got that select draw yeah and it's like but you don't have big game predators there like you're gonna have in these other states that are reintroducing them and that's, that's, it's gonna drive true. then it's they're gonna they're gonna eat that herd up and then um, once they do that, they're going to start moving. And I know we've gotten way off the subject of where we were going to go with this. And I apologize, but, uh, you know, that's, I think that's something that, I, th- I think we've hit on something you and I could p- probably talk a long time about. And, um, yeah. uh, Daniel, what's your input on it? You, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just sitting here taking it all in. But, yeah, I, I mean, I can see changes just within the last, you know, say 10 years you know that I've, that I've hunted and I guess you could really put it back to about the past eight years that I've been traveling out state hunting and see changes uh, with a lot of that stuff just from then to now in eight years you know I, good lord willing I got you know 50 more years to go but you know, that's not guaranteed uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see what it's going to be like then oh yeah it's uh it's going to be drastic changes, I think, because it's, the, I know, like, the, the growth of pop, of the human population in areas and dispersing the animals, you're making the, you know, you're, you're driving, we'll use coyotes, for example, for y'all and myself being from South Louisiana, then I have them up here where I'm at, but it's like, you're getting more people living there, so... Now everybody's griping and complaining. Oh, there's coyote. You know, the coyote killed my cat or the coyote attacked my dog. Well, you you took the coyotes home. What do you expect? And it's like, yeah. you know, it's that, like, go that, ahead. That's one thing I think hurting animals, wildlife, worse than anything, is this human, how we're spreading, going out of any suburbs of any, I've traveled, I've been in all 50 states, I travel a lot. You can get around any major town. You can see old pasture silos and stuff, especially as farm country. There'll be still old silos and, and, and subdivisions. And you're like, yep, they just keep moving out in the country, building subdivisions. Yep, and it's like, it used to be, like you said, go back to the people at a place to hunt, then Grandpa died and, it, you know, the state got sold, and you drive by there and what used to be like a, you know, old cattle ranch or, you know, just whatever, cattle farm or whatever they had, like, places to hunt is now subdivisions. Yeah, and that's that's hurting our biggest that, that that's hurting our hurt more our population more than anything when it comes to animals. But once you, it goes back to you get people that moved in these areas that then they start voting for stuff that's affecting the farmers and ranchers that are having to deal with the outcome of how people that aren't affected with it voted. And well, I like I like to make the comment on getting folks' head on all of our things. I done a podcast with Cus Strickland last year. Mm-hmm. And he, here's here's the guy that he looked at hunting. He said 20% of the population love it, 20% of it hate it. But that 60% in the middle is the one we got to read. Watch how we present ourselves. Yep. He said, go over that. So what, get over 50%. That's when you're going to still start. Because right now, that's the thing right there one way or the other. 
that sums it up. And it's like, or another, uh, I don't remember who show who it was. They talk about like and we'll break like twenty percent, you know, hunt twenty percent don't, and like the sixty makes the difference. Well, out of that group that hunts, it's like one percent of those people are killing the are killing like ninety percent of the record bucks. You know, it's like it, it's yeah, crazy how it breaks down. Well, they all same way out west. You know, it's like they say five or ten percent don't cut kill the dark tail. <laughs> It, it is, but but that one percent, you know, I, I consider my men dangles in that class. You know, we put it, we go after like work. Yeah, you, know, we, we put you, you put your work in. It's a, it's a, it turned when, you know, I haven't got back into as much as I was because getting moved and getting situated. Because we moved to uh, Oklahoma that tomorrow make two years ago. We lived in a spot just out of the city. We lived north of Oklahoma City in Edmond for eight months while we sold our house down south and bought our place out in east oklahoma so i moved from like cut south louisiana country living to like a gated community in a subdivision in a in edmond oklahoma which is a suburb of, of oklahoma city and like we, li- we lived in an eight house community right the front four houses were all retired older people they fed the deer the back four houses hunted the deer so, like, and uh, it was funny because they'd be like, even though the older people knew, oh, well, they're, they're going to kill them if they go back there. And they would feed them in the front, and then the ones that would feed them in the back. And, like, I stood there and watched my neighbor with his crossbow shoot an eight point out his kitchen window. <laughs> and uh, I'm laughing after he did. I go there. I was like, hey, we can shoot deer here. He's like, heck yeah, man. I'm like, well, that's good to know. Like, I didn't know. I've been watching him and not shot one. Could have shot him two days ago. And uh, but yeah, it was uh, but it was like you, you take that breakdown of that fifty percent of the people hunted, fifty percent didn't hunt. But out of that fifty percent that didn't hunt, only two or three of them, you know, like twenty percent of them. So I would say like eight people, only two two of them would bitch about the ones in the back killing the deer. So it broke even in that small of a group, it breaks your numbers down like you like you just said, because Strickland said, and. It's it's insane that it's it's like that, but it, it, he summed it up in, incredible. Like if if we don't present ourselves in a professional way and not, it's it, it, turn the other side off. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you can turn the ones that aren't that are on the fence against you real quick. And uh, yeah. so all right, well. My third question I'd like to ask everybody, and I think we've hit them, was kind of like your, you know, your plans for this year. And um, I think y'all both hit those of what y'all plan on doing. Uh, I know Daniel did, and I think you did too, Jeremy, correct? Yeah, well, that's what I said. I was going to Wyoming first, and I'll probably do Kansas, Indiana, uh, Ohio, you know, that late October, November. And then I'll come back to the South, and I'll hunt Arkansas, and I'll hunt Mississippi. I mean, the may end up going to Alabama late January. That's late. See, that's what. How, when's Arkansas's rut? Is it kind of on par with the others? Uh, yeah. You get that northeast in the Ozarks. That's pretty much that November, like the Midwest. I think you get further south in the south, south Arkansas rivers. You get more to that December, like our Delta, Mississippi Delta is. That, that's right about Thanksgiving to the first, or the tenth of December. Mm-hmm. See, we, um, the spot I'm in here in Oklahoma is uh, that last week of October, it starts ramping up. And usually about November the 3rd through the 10th, 11th, you got basically like your first rut. Then um, le- the last week of thing, after, like, the last week between like Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, like right after Thanksgiving, 1st of October, I mean November, December, that one month, you'll see a big movement again. And once those two movements, like that, that time frame passes, you're you're back to like yeah. it, it, it's shut it's shut down and you know it. Yeah. Well, basically, the late don't wait. I mean, look, any weather, hunt weather, they feed back feed and dead. Yep. Yep. And uh, see, like last year, um, 
I killed one the week of um, the last week of October. Then I killed the one the day after Thanksgiving. And we're two bucks state. I killed two bucks. I didn't. I didn't hunt anything other than that. I hunted three times. Saw deer all three times. I filmed a little six point for probably 15 minutes, meandering around, man, and everything, just you know. And uh, on my own place, it, you know, and it's like, but my rut was defined. I knew when it was, which was really cool because, like you said, you know, hunting in the south, the ruts, you you can hunt 50 miles apart, and the ruts a month apart, not two, you know. And uh, you know, so getting to see a true defined rut is. A lot of guys, like my, you know, like, and you, you've seen it, guys be like, oh, you know, they were chasing. I don't think a lot of people actually know what chasing is and, you know, and, the, and a real rut is. Like, they'll see a doe, then 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, a buck comes walking down the same trail. Oh, they was chasing. Not, no, he just happened to be on the same path. Hey, you know, he was roaming looking. He was roaming looking. Yep. He wasn't chasing. I've, you know, when, chasing's a whole different thing, and, like, you know it when you see it. But a lot of guys I don't think have ever seen the true rut. And, yeah. you know, and my, my wife got to see see it up close and personal when we lived in the city. Like I saw out earlier, she walked out one morning, two bucks went chasing a doe past her. They ran down the driveway, like ran over the trash can, almost hit her. <laughs> I get home that evening, she's like, what the heck was wrong with them? I was laughing. I was like, that's that's the rut. When people say they're chasing, that's what you saw. Like, yeah, rut was up on it. <laughs> Yeah, it was. I, it was like, man, I should have been home, home instead of at work. But um, I think that kind of we, we veered off. But I think we had a real good talk on what we were doing. I appreciate the time. And um, I'm a uh, go on and name y'all's uh, Facebook page. You have do you have Facebook pages? You can use your personal or bit, or if you have a business one, then the the um, YouTube channel and all that. Give us that information where everybody can find y'all. We got a. Uh, we got Do It Yourself Hunter Facebook, our Facebook page, and then we have our Do It Yourself Hunter Facebook group page. And then uh, Do It Yourself Hunter on YouTube. Um, I got a, I got a personal Instagram, uh, Daniel underscore lemon 19. Um, I need to get a Do It Yourself Hunter gram, but we haven't done that yet. So, but yeah, that's, uh, that's what you can follow us up with. We put a little bit on TikTok, uh, Do It Yourself Hunter. So, yeah. Yeah, check us out, like I said. Definitely. Um, I guess I know we veered off of kind of the, the subject there, and I apologize for that, but we, we kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole there, and we're about an hour into it. I know y'all probably need to start wrapping up yourselves. Um, so, like I said, that's where everybody can find you. You can do it yourself, hunters. You know, basically, they can come there and see your videos, and it shows what y'all do and what – and you're, you know, y'all's public land hunting and everything, and that's that's what I, that, I'm, I'm a proponent of that, and I like promoting, and that's why I wanted y'all to come on to, you know, so we can get y'all's name out there more too of what y'all do, and you know, and y'all, you, 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 you summed up a few things that when, when my real job idea getting y'all here, it had nothing to do with that, and I think we went down a pretty good path of talking about, and it's uh, it may it, maybe I'm stretching here, but do it yourself, Hunter. You know, bringing the other, like, making sure people are learning and doing and everything, but, like, you need to educate yourself, and that's that's something I think I feel like y'all are doing. You're, you're educating people of what's going on in the other states and everything, and that's, you know, it, it, if it happens in one state, it can happen in yours, and that's where, that's that's what we got to work on as a, as a group. Like you said, the 20% on each side of it and the 60%, but it's like, you know, you got your bow hunters, rifle hunters, your traditional archer and all that. We, we can't bicker amongst ourselves. We have to stick together and be that 20%. And you can try a number. Don't, don't, don't complain about somebody else. Over there hunting legal. They're out there hunting. Yeah, they're, it's like... They crowd for it. Yeah, if it, I don't care if they're dog hunters, if they're doing man pushes, if it's legal where they're at, hey, have at it. You know? Yeah. And it's like, I, you know, it's like, I always laughed, like something my dad would say and um you know it, he talked about you know like, he's my dad's 65 i think I, he might yeah 65 you know that that generation a little different they actually you know a lot of them hounding rabbits at night with a 22 and a headlight and uh, <laughs> you know he talks about all the time he's like you want he's like i and he's like hunter safety he said i think they are he said even if they don't shoot them they need to take kids out or you know, everybody that goes through hunter safety at night with a headlight 
and show them. He said, because look at a spider eye, look at a rabbit eye, look at a deer eye. He said, it's a, he said, he, and he's like, the guys at night hunted like that were way much, they were way safer. They knew what they were shooting at. And I'm like, no, it, it's bad to say it. And I, I might catch a bunch of slack for this for saying it on air, but he, he's he's kind of right. They, they knew what they were shooting. Nowadays, um, when I grew up in the sixth grade, they got hunters in. See, I, I, got I, I got it in seventh grade. So, you know, I, I know I just kind of got less popular, but they, they could be in it. They may not hunt. I don't know the, you know, the, the safety of a gun. If you ever get in a situation one day. Oh, it's, yeah, it's like my, you know, it's like, my, little, my youngest little girl, she's four. She Her birthday was this past Friday. She turned four. She knows that, like, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a rifle, a pellet rifle, whatever, in the corner. She knows not to walk there and touch it. And it's like because she's been raised around them. Yeah. You know, you take the kids that have never been around them. And, yeah, some people are raised around them. They still do stupid stuff. But the ones that were never raised around them is your ones that usually have the accidents. Yeah. And it's like, like said, the gun, the gun don't hurt nobody. It's got it in their hands. One does hurt. You know, and how they know, and how they know how to use it. Yeah, there's no different. A gun, no different. Oh, I was just gonna say that. You know, you the uh, a drunk driver wrecks a car. They don't want to like. They don't want to, you know, talk, get rid of the car. Yeah. Well, you know, I always say these these phones and these the teenagers' hands. I mean, get whatever you're but texting and driving. Oh, it's. It's a, it's a lot, and it's like, you know, just, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of looking at my phone when I shouldn't be. It's like, you know, hell. So we started off down a rabbit hole, and I went on and cut it off there. Um, great group of guys. I look forward to having them on again. Um, y'all y'all take the time. Reach out to us. Let us know what you thought. Reach out to those guys and um, take time to get into what they do. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, like I said, I look forward to having them on again. Um, y'all, th- thank y'all for taking y'all's time to listen to Delta Lodge Outdoors. We couldn't do this without the listeners. We're super appreciative of, of y'all. And we have a few more guests lined up that will be coming on and working on that steady. So, And if you want to be on, reach out to us. Hell, we can talk about anything. What, you, hunting, non-hunting, fishing, trapping, like outdoors, camping, whatever. You. Come on, let's talk.